He's a one who sets historical time points for us by mentioning specific time periods so that we can know that Jesus' ministry, for example, was a little over three years. Without that, once again, it would have been anyone's guess of how long Jesus' ministry would last. It would have been, you know, at best, without the chronology of John, it'd be at best, you could guess that his ministry was about a year, maybe, a little over, okay? So we need John as a chronologer. He's not forsaken being a chronologer in the book of Revelation. And if there should anything that should stand out to everybody that this is sequential, this, this is a chronology, is he goes, seal number one, seal number two, seal number three, seal number four, seal number five, seal number six, seal number seven. Trumpet number one, trumpet number two, trumpet number three, trumpet number four, trumpet number five, trumpet number six, trumpet number seven. Bile number one, bile number two, bile number three, bile number four. No. There could, I mean, that is painstaking chronology. Okay, so when these folks want to step out on this soapbox and start telling you that these things are happening over here and these other things are happening over there and they go and mix all of the chronology up, first and foremost, they are violating the sanctity of the text. And secondly, they are violating common sense. This is chronology. And, you're gonna, you're, and what happens is we get into a place where we get so passionate about our idea. We get so emotionally attached to our idea that we just got to make it work. And we don't want to make it work. We're not trying to make it work. We're not trying to have a new idea here so that, you know, we can appear whatever. We just simply want to know what God's saying. We want to get a hold of the truth. We want to move with Father. My Uncle Charles, great theologian, and he said this. He said, if you want to move in wisdom and have wisdom, then all you need to do is know what God's doing and do it with him. Pretty simple. You want wisdom? You want to move in wisdom? Know what God's doing and do it with him. Pretty simple, right? He's telling us what he's doing. Okay? And, and, and let's do it with him. And then as we faithfully walk with the Lord, he shows us other things. I want to... I'm, I'm, I'm asking Father right now. I want to know specifics about what he's doing right now. What are his specific plans for revival in America? I want to know, what are your specific plans, Father, for the Great Awakening? I'm on it. I want to be a part of this. I want to know. I don't want to guess. I want to hear, hear him tell me so that I can participate with him. You're going to be successful if you know what he's doing. Jesus knew what Father was doing. Jesus would hear Father say to do something. He would do it. He did what he heard to do. And guess what? It's going to work when you hear Father say, raise him from the dead. It's going to happen. Okay. Um, A.A. A. Allen, some of the people that were around A.A. Allen, he said, A.A. Allen knew what he was, he knew he was going to get healed before he ever went out. What he did was he just really spent a lot of time just talking about it, you know, saying, well, what if God does this? And he already knew God was going to do it. And he already knew how many people were going to get healed that were, were that were, uh, had cancer or that, how many deaf ears were going to open and blind eyes. God had already showed him. He'd been in a place of prayer and talking to Father. It wasn't just, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's fine. Sometimes we just flow, but I believe that there's a place and a realm with God that we can just know up front and then minister out of that. So there's a key I gave you and the key is important and you hopefully you become to, come more to appreciate the key as you mature and you grow in learning the, the book of Revelation. The key being Revelation chapter 1, um, verse um, 19. Can't violate that. People are violating it on TV every day. What they're doing is they're saying they're taking the things that shall be hereafter and they're putting them in right now, in the church right now. I heard somebody say, well, the, the, the star wormwood that's going to fall out of heaven. I, I'm pretty sure that's third trumpet. I haven't refreshed myself on that. We're right around in there. That that was when Chernobyl, uh, the power plant, Chernobyl uh, went down. Look, first of all, <laughs> you're going to have to get through Revelation chapter 6 tonight. You're going to find out that this is a very different geography. It doesn't even look like it does right now. But by the time you get past the seven seals, by the time, uh, come on, not even getting into the trumpets. It's a different landscape altogether. And second of all, the, the waters become so contaminated that we begin to lose one-third of life on the face of the earth. Chernobyl didn't do that. I mean, come on. Uh, Fukushima is Chernobyl on, on radioactivity. 
okay? And it hasn't even done that, although it's had, I believe, worse impact. And, but we're not talking about something on the earth. You can't violate that. You can't violate the sanctity of the text and the literalness of the text and make it whatever you want to be, make it arbitrarily because somebody said, well, there's an ancient word that wood, that wormwood means radioactivity or, or something. Give me a break. I mean, you, that's not what the Lord said to first, even if there was some Hebrew word that said that wormwood was related to radioactivity or Chernobyl or some Greek word, and I think it's some Russian word. I think it's some, you know, some ancient Slavic dialect. Even if it were, that doesn't mean nothing. The Lord said a star will fall out of heaven. Chernobyl didn't fall out of heaven. <laughs> okay, so come on. Don't believe this stuff. Don't believe this stuff because, I, you know, we see on the battlefront a war strategy is to create a propaganda campaign to where that people begin to believe something other than what's really happening or a distraction to say, to try to convince your enemy that you're going to attack them over here. Meanwhile, you're going to attack them over here. That was how D-Day was successful. Satan uses that kind of strategy. He's always running interference. He's trying to distract people. Well, good, praise God, we got the word, okay? We've got a very clear key of interpretation. Therefore, we're going to keep the things in the, in the, in, within the framework of that which is, right, the things which are currently existing, the church. And that, and that address is unmistakable. How many times the Lord says church and, and addresses the issues and the needs to the Lord Jesus to his church in chapter 2 and chapter 3 is unmistakable. And then move to chapter 4 and the church is not mentioned anymore. We're done. And if that isn't a gigantic clue, I, you know, it's a gigantic clue. The things which are hereafter. Okay? So, look, look with me here in Revelation chapter 6 in the chronology now. And um, we go, and I saw, and I'm just going to read this to you. And I, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. This is the beginning of of the tribulation. This is the beginning of the wrath of God poured out upon sin and iniquity. It is His judgment. People have talked about God judged this, God judged that. It was a judgment of God, 9-11, all these other things. This is the beginning of the judgments of God. This is not Jesus riding on a white horse coming down, down to earth. This is not Jesus. That ain't Jesus. He will be on the white horse at the end of this, okay? He, in chapter 19, this is, chrono, this is chronologically describing to us the events. This is the beginning of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week. There, if I took you through the, six, the 70 weeks of Daniel's vision, the 69th week to the very day and the hour was fulfilled when Jesus was crucified on Calvary's cross. He said the rocks would cry out if you didn't speak right now because this is the appointed time. The Essenes who had made the most accurate time clock until modern times made that time clock all around prophecy, primarily using the book of Daniel as their hub. These guys were exact about time. They were preparing themselves for this great war in heaven where the sons of light would battle the sons of darkness and the Messiah would lead the way and they would be part of the army. Thus they were in the desert continually washing themselves, continually keeping themselves pure and separated that they might be found worthy to participate in this great battle. The very moment, the very day, the very hour of Daniel's 69th week happened and nothing took place. They're standing there looking at one another going, what happened? We know we're accurate. We know we've got the very time, the very day, the very hour. Nothing has taken place. They're looking at one another and all they can see is there's this one person who said he was the son of God who got crucified at Calvary. Their eyes were open. They are more than likely the 3,000 that gave their life to Jesus there on the, on the first uh, sermon of Pentecost. They are suddenly turning. It's the Essenes that are in 
mass turning to Jesus because they had the prophecy right and what they thought was going to happen did not happen and the only event that happened at that very hour at the time that the Passover was to be slain on the day of Passover was that Jesus Christ of Nazareth one reported to be the Messiah the Son of God was crucified for the sins of the world suddenly the lights came on the revelation came and they realized he by himself destroyed all the powers of darkness he the Son of God the light of the world they the only needed one took on the whole of the sons of darkness and wiped them out this is how accurate prophecy is now we have been almost 2,000 years between the 69th week and the 70th week. Seven, it being a, a week of years, each day standing for a year of time. And when we look then, lo and behold, in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation numbers for us the days Talk about chronology. And it not only numbers for us the days, but breaks it out into two, three and a half year segments so that we may understand even a more perfect chronological block of time separating first the, what was called the tribulation or the wrath of God compared to the great tribulation or the great wrath, which is the last three and a half years. Are you with me? So once again, I don't care who the teacher is, you have to demand that they stick to a chronology because I've given you five layers of chronology tonight to where they once there is no way around this. You can't shift chapter 13 into today. You can't shift chapter 6 into the seventh year. You can't shift chapter 18 into the first year. You can't make the first seal be somewhere jammed between the second and third trumpet and the sixth trumpet over here jammed between the 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 the, the, the you know the sixth and the and the, uh, the fifth and the sixth seal or take the, the fourth seal and jam it over here between the third and the fifth vial. <laughs> now, when you become astute, you begin to hear people and you're going, you just took the fourth seal, stuck it between the third and fourth vial. You can't do that. Otherwise, if you don't know, you're just going, wow, that really sounds good. My goodness, this man is really bright. Yeah, he's so bright <laughs> that we can't see the truth no more. And we blinded. So, it's important. I'm just saying, I, I really stirred. I was stirred in my spirit to go ahead and start teaching on end time prophecy because of all of the rise of nonsense that I'm hearing like never before on a level that, that is just, it, maybe, it's, maybe it's just it happened in the past, but you know, I wasn't, it, it wasn't exposed to this level because you didn't have so many channels of Christian TV. Maybe that's it. Okay. So we we're going to deal with this, this person that goes forth to conquer, conquer, uh, and, and conquering. Look, we're, we're fitting this. We're going to overlay this in the book of, Tribula, uh, 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 book of Revelation in, in the book of Daniel. We know that this is the man of sin whom is, who's um, popularly called the Antichrist. He is going to be revealed, okay? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul said he cannot be revealed until the hinderer of iniquity is removed. Me, you, the church. We are called the hinderer of iniquity. Much sin has been able to take an upper hand in society because the church capitulated, okay? We became as those that Ezekiel prophesied concerning in Israel in the 18th chapter. We became those who were as a, 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 a wall that was daubed with untempered mortar so that the enemy came and just leaned on it and it fell over. They didn't have to even create war, weapons of war to bust a hole through because it was daubed with untempered mortar and the prophet Ezekiel says because you're teaching them lies, you're teaching them the words and doctrines of false prophets rather than the word which I've spoken unto you, which is truly a defense, okay? So here we are, we're supposed to be standing against sin and iniquity. We're supposed to take a stand for righteousness and purity. But if we participate with sin, we're overwhelmed with it. We're brought into bondage by it. And so it runs rampant the world. Well, ultimately, the church will be taken out. 
One of my, one of my uh, dear friends, Carlos Adekanya, she sat down with me one day and, and actually Sandy was, where Sandy? Mm -hmm. Sandy was interpreting for me. And he says, Mark, do you know, and, and I, I really respect Carlos on this because God has given us such a unique ability to deal with principalities and wickedness. I mean, he, he took out whole cities, whole regions because God gave him an authority to deal with demon spirits and to deal with angels of darkness. And he's telling me, he says, Mark, do you know why Spain hates America so much? Do you know why France hates America so much? Germany, he's just walking through all of them. And he was, once again, he was keep coming back to the whole point that because we have taken such a stand spiritually, we have, the church has remained for the most part, strong comparatively, that we hold back the forces of darkness that otherwise would run rampant through the earth. Well, take that to another scale and recognize what happens when the whole church is taken out. And, and I'm not gonna talk on the rapture of the church or what we call the catching away of the church tonight. I just want you to know, I am definitely convinced of the catching away of the church. I don't argue about it. I have friends who don't, aren't convinced. I just leave it. I'll go ahead and throw out a bunch of questions that they can't answer and just leave them. You know, and everybody knows that about me and, and we're fine. But I am absolutely convinced in the catching away. Number one, if the catching away did not happen, then I'm going to tell you right now. I can tell you the day and the hour of the coming of the Lord. If the, if the coming of the Lord was not the catching away, I can tell you the day and the hour. Why? Because I have a chronology and a number of days and years. I can count from the moment that the desolation of abomination takes place in Israel, in the temple, and tell you the very day that the Messiah will show up from heaven with ten thousands of the saints to execute judgment upon all the ungodly for the ungodly deeds which they ungodly committed, which prophet Enoch declared and described. Right? And I have many evidences uh, like that. And I make the catching away a part of the resurrection because the Bible makes it a part of the resurrection. I see that all Paul's focus was, was he did not believe he was going to die. He thought he was going to get caught away. He was always using the plural, we. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up. He didn't say we which are alive and remain shall see the Antichrist. And we which are alive and remain shall go through a great tribulation first. And we which are alive and remain shall experience the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. It's, it's we which are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are asleep for the dead in Christ shall rise first and he didn't talk about nothing about some great tribulation between that and I've got list upon list upon list of arguments against those that believe that we're going through the wrath of God where he's pouring out his wrath upon sin and iniquity a rebellious world there is no harvest there people somebody said oh there's going to be a great harvest in tri tribulation no no there's going to be any harvest in the tribulation these people are set against God right. there is no harvest the rebellion has ultimately come to full a fully ripened condition spiritually and we will hear the Lord say now thrust in your sickle for the grapes of wrath are fully ripe that's what he will do at the end of the tribulation the end of seven years and that's where Jesus now will come and press out the wine press of his wrath against sin and he's stomping look at the picture look at the picture those of you who have an artistic mind he's stomping sinners who would not give up on following Satan and their blood is splashing on his garment. <laughs> and I say, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, come real over me. There's a lot of things people don't know about the Lord. There's a lot of things. When, when we could talk about Jesus coming ruling with a rod of iron and smashing everybody who opposes him and will not obey. When he says to Egypt and to Assyria, if you don't come up for the Feast of Tabernacles, no rain's coming on your crops. You will have famine. Now listen to me. He'd say, I just want everybody to come up that wants to have a relationship with me. You didn't say that at all. To get yourself up here, are you in trouble? You can call it legalism if you want. I say, hallelujah, unto you belongs all the power and the glory, the honor and dominion. Come rule over me. And I can go through a long, long, long list of this that will upset the apple cart of a lot of doctrinal ideas that are being put forth that just don't meet the test and evaluation of God's word. 
And, and I want, my desire is to impart these things to God's people. Listen to me, dear people. You don't have to be an intellectual giant. You don't have to have a perfect, uh, you know, um, photographic memory for these things. All you got to do is just catch it. The Holy Ghost and deposit this in, into you. And you will remember these things right out of the realms of the Holy Ghost. He will bring into your remembrance. And as soon as you hear people talking nonsense, it, the Holy Ghost will go bring right the, these things right into your remembrance. And then ultimately, God will raise you up and use you to be able to see other people established in the Word. Established in the Word. There is only one defense against deception. Yeah. Am I immune to deception? Absolutely not. The Lord said that unless those days be shortened, even the very elect could be deceived. Satan, or he said would be deceived. Satan is a master of his craft. My only protection is to stay in the word, to stay in the truth. That's my protection, to obey God, to hear what his word says. It's a shield. It's a defense. His presence, his glory. His word for us is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It's by his word abiding in us, hallelujah, that we overcome the wicked one. Being established and set in the truth. The spirit of truth has come to lead us and guide us to all truth. And that truth is the word. Amen. And that's the way it is. And that's where we want to stay. We don't want to take it away from it. And we don't want to add to it. And, and the Lord emphasizes that both in the Old Testament and he also emphasizes it in the New Testament. And so he places a great severity on the exactness of the word. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. You're, he says, if you add to it, these plagues should be added to you. Well, that's placing a lot of severity on don't mess with the word. He said, if you take away from it, your name should be taken out of the book of life. Then that will help people who just believe that they're, once they're saved, they're always saved and they can't get out of it. Okay, because that's just not true. And, and we've got a list of things of that nature. But I'm, I'm really trying to emphasize, the Lord takes the credibility and the accuracy of the word even to another level and says it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one jot or one tittle to be altered. Don't alter nothing. Believe it. Accept it. Benefit. Say it's good. God did it for me. It's mine. Praise God. I don't know how it's mine. It's an unspeakable gift, but it's mine. It's mine. It's mine. And then you're going to ultimately find yourself in a place where Satan can't touch you. We're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Hallelujah. He can access us. Praise God. Amen. That is a wonderful place and position to be. Just believe the word. Amen. Just obey the word. That's why we are so strong. Another great reason why we're so strong on the assembly of the brethren, the church. And that's why Paul said, as you see the day approaching, the day of deception, the day of apostasy, apostasy meaning rebellion against the covenant, thus you meet, you have to be a part of the covenant in order to be a part of apostasy. You can't be an apostate until you rebel against the covenant. That's really how it, the word is, is, is derived. It's the origin of the word, how the word was formed. It was formed out of a covenant to rebel against the covenant. As you see the apostasy coming, as you see the day of rebellion coming, Get together all the more. Assemble yourself more together. All the more together. Why? Because we need to be stirred up in the truth. Thus we should be deceived and fall away. Okay. So, going on with this now. And, 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 and later in life, you, if you haven't already encountered it, you'll understand why I put so much emphasis on who the conqueror is. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. Let me say something else to you about the seals and about the, the trumpets, the blast of horns, and about the vials. None of them are blessings. <laughs> None of them are blessings. They are all the releasing of God's wrath. It's upon the face of the earth. Unfortunately, there are those who have tried to make some of the seals a blessing. Like this one, the first seal is a blessing because if it's Jesus coming, that's a blessing. Okay? And then they try to make um, uh, the last trumpet a blessing. Um, the, 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 the seventh trumpet try to make that a blessing, right? Because they try to equate the seventh trumpet to the last trumpet, which means then uh, we're caught away. Okay? The Lord will send with the voice of an archangel, sound of trumpet, they which are dead shall rise. Okay? Are you with me? Um, should be changed in twinkling of an eye, right? Well, that's not a blessing trumpet. That's a cursed trumpet. No blessing in it. Are you with me? Yeah. And those are the, for the folks who believe that you're going to be caught away in the middle of the tribulation. 
okay? So we got all these guys. We got these people, or, you know, what, we got folks who want to espouse the theories. You know, the Bible isn't for theorizing, okay? The, Bi your, the way you plant things in the garden, you can theorize about that. But the Bible isn't for theorizing. The Bible is for truth. It's absolutes. It's not theories. It's absolutes. I personally take offense to someone saying, well, we have three theories here. Do you believe in the gap theory? Please don't do that to me. You're grieving me, man. <laughs> I don't believe any theories when it comes to God's word. God's word is true and it's accurate, and we want to sit still and listen to him so we can understand exactly what he said. I want to hear no about, the we don't want to hear about theories. Amen. Amen. Okay. So when he opened up the second seal, he said, come see. And there went out another horse, which was red. And power was given unto him to set upon the horse to take peace from the earth. And that they should kill one another. And that there was given unto him a great sword. Now, um, I'm going to show you by this the testimony of many verses of scripture basically a civil war everywhere every man's brother every man against his brother every man's sword against his brother we're talking about the most unbelievable chaotic upheaval of war on the planet instantly peace taken from the earth every man sword against his brother then we then we go on and um and I, and I want to emphasize that. And nobody's seen that. There's no one seen the results of the second still. Are you with me? No one's seen that. Does everybody agree? Has there ever been a time where it, peace has been completely taken from the earth and everybody was engaged, not as nations, not as kingdoms rising against kingdoms. Every man, and I'm going to prove this to you. I'm going to bring out scriptures from a number of different prophets here in a few minutes to help establish that this is civil war, every man's sword set against his brother, against his neighbor, okay? So it's almost like worse than the civil war of America. I wanna emphasize the second seal hasn't happened. If the second seal hasn't happened, the third trumpet hasn't happened, okay? Good. Underscoring the fact that they should kill one another. Underscoring that. By the time the tribulation is over, there's not gonna be a whole lot of folks left. It's about death and destruction on the highest level. Death and destruction. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And behold, and I look, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on, the, on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, see that thou hurt not the wine nor the oil. When this happens, this is ultimately going to be a situation of great famine. And I'm gonna show you verses of scripture once again in many of the prophets tonight where the Lord will dry up the sea and he will dry up the rivers. Has anybody ever seen their seas and the rivers dried up? That's the time that you get to the fourth seal. Once again, people, it is a really radically changed event. This is no common event. This is no Chernobyl. This is no World War II. This is no Fukushima. This is no uh, Mussolini. This is no uh, Hitler. This is no um, anybody else you want to think of in history. It's never happened. Nothing like this has ever happened. This didn't happen in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. This didn't happen any time in ancient history, before the church or since the day of creation. Nothing like this has happened. It's going to happen. I want you to mark this. It's in the future because many people are saying right now, there's people, I don't know where they're getting the money from. <laughs> But they're sitting on television every night spending copious amounts of hours talking about that we in the tribulation right now and they're selling buckets of food. I mean, goodness gracious, and generators. And I'm waiting for the demon locust uh, repellent and, um, uh, I, I, and uh, how, to, how to protect yourself. Well, I'm just, I, I, I better be careful. I'm going to get real cynical here in a minute. 
food is not, if it were just a matter of food, that'd be a small thing. Look, I'm telling you right now, angels getting in the big middle of this thing. And we're talking about fallen angels. We're talking about demon spirits. We're talking about demon locusts that have hair like women and a sting like a scorpion. And that ain't no helicopter. That ain't no helicopter. By the time this is over, by the time, well, by the time this is half over, there is nothing left in modern weaponry. Ultimately, Isaiah, the prophets, uh, Jeremiah, and others describe the Battle of Armageddon. It is spears, spear chunking, and arrow shooting. And God makes it very literal because they will not need to cut wood down for seven years to burn for fuel because they will have enough fuel just collecting all the spears and sword, uh, spears and bows and arrows from the Battle of Armageddon. Now, when's the last time you heard that? I'm going to show you these things. Why? I am a literalist. I, I believe that God is already way advanced. He doesn't need it. He wasn't, the prophet wasn't all hemmed up because he couldn't understand what a um, helicopter was. I mean... I can, I can bust that argument too because they saw things in heaven and they described perfectly what, what they saw in heaven and they had no means to, to, to relate to that. Are you with me? God shows it to them and you can't mistake a helicopter for a demon coming up out of the pit of hell. Come on, with a scorpion's tail. They knew what a scorpion looked like. They were from the desert. <laughs> and they say it's like a scorpion tail but it's got this weird thing spinning real fast. Like a chariot wheel. I would have described it like that. If it was a helicopter. <laughs> and besides that, when's the last time you saw a helicopter who's in, the head looked like, you know, a, a man, <laughs> right? And, and had long flowing hair like a woman. I'm not seeing one of them. So come on, people, let's stop this nonsense. Let's stop this nonsense. Let's, let's get some fear of God here and reverence for the Word of God. I'm, and I just appreciate those of you get to, who got the, the, the camera up and going because these things need to be broadcasted. It, I, I asked the Father, Father, why does these uh, sermons and these messages and these, these ideas and these philosophies seem to be so well-funded that they're broadcasted all over the earth? And in, why, O oh Lord God, does it seem like your word is being, is being kept back and, and not being heard? And I haven't gotten any answer on that, but I'm going to tell you right now. I know that the Lord's given us authority, and he's waiting for somebody to get up and start moving and do something about it. Because they got their seat, because they got up and started moving and started doing something about what they believed. And somehow they got empowered by it. Huh? So you got to give them credit for where credit, credit is due. They, at least they didn't sit home wondering why they weren't getting their message out. Again, they're getting their message out. What I'm interested in is getting the Word of God proclaimed and just laying it out there in a simple way to where the anybody, any baby, could understand it. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, what I've got to say isn't for the wise and the prudent. It isn't for these people who've got to have all this in, you know, insight. You know, <laughs> if it were helicopters, you had to wait to the 21st century, 20th century to understand what the Word of God says. And Father didn't write the Word of God like that. He made it simple. He made it apparent. He said, Father, I thank you that you revealed it to babes. I thank you that your Word is so simple. <laughs> Hallelujah. That the babies get it. And that's us. Amen. And so, I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, okay, a measure. We were talking about famine there. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice say, come, come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse. And his name that, uh, that set on him was death and hell, followed after him. And, and power was given to him over 25% of the earth to kill with a sword, to kill with hunger, to kill with death, and with the beast of the earth. Never happened. It's never happened in the known history of man that we've ever seen something like this. Can he use plagues? Yes. It, this is 25% of the earth just under the fourth seal. You already got death and destruction in the famine of the third seal. You've already got death and destruction in the release of, of taking 
of war and taking peace from off the earth under the second seal. Okay? Are you with me, dear people? Yes. Uh, how many of you are going to be left? You wonder. We're not talking about evangelizing. There's no evangelizing going on. People are ducking and running. And guess what? This first three and a half years, the last three and a half years, people are going to be ducking and running and hiding in caves even more because that's the way the Lord set it up. He said, don't, when you come down, when you come, when, don't you go back into your house if you're out there working in the field, run straight for the mountains. If you're working on the housetop, don't go back in the house and get something. Run, run for, head for the hills because what's getting ready to happen has never been released on the face of the earth. Get ready for what's about to take place by reason of the trumpet that is about to sound. You know? No. People making light of this. And that's why I want to emphasize the extreme of it. This, there, there, there is no a bucket of, uh, no, uh, Soybeans gonna make it get you through, or we got to your seven pack meal right here. I better behave myself. I'm having a hard time. I honestly, I must say, I sit and watch it. It's entertaining to me. I sit and I watch it, and I go, "You gotta be kidding me!" And I laugh and I check them and watches it with me. I'm just like, I can't believe this. People are listening to this and believing it. Look how serious they are. Can you imagine having to live off of that for seven years? And then we got this water purifier, okay? <laughs> that's gonna take care of radioactivity. You and I know that filter is gonna work about two times and then kaput. And they're acting like it's gonna get you through seven years. And it's like, you know, then that's where I start feeling a little sad because we live in a very educated society. And they're going, these guys are out of their minds, you know. But nonetheless. <laughs> The, the world's going to see a different. The world's going to see a different, this, a different representation of Jesus. They're not going to look and see a bunch of people just saying a bunch of nonsense. They're going to see God's love, signs and wonders and miracles. They're, they're going to see God's compassion in our eyes. They're going to see His power in our hands. Amen. They're going to see. They're going to hear the expressions of His authority through our mouth. Okay, that's amen. what we're going to do. God, Father's going to do it. And, um, amen. Amen. So, so. He, this, this, um, this angel of darkness is what it is. This is angel of darkness. Mm -hmm. And um, we can look back in the Old Testament. We can see where one angel of darkness killed 45,000 men just an hour. Okay? I mean, the list goes on. This angel of darkness has power, and we don't know how long it goes. But it goes long enough to just under his reign of terror for 25% of the earth to be killed with a sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beast of the field. That means, you know, anything. Everything qualifies. Wolves, lions, everything. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony in which they held. Okay? So we see that there are going to be people during the tribulation that are going to be preaching. We understand who those are because God is going to identify them to us as 144,000 virtuous men who have never known a woman from the 12 tribes of Israel, and he names each tribe. I had a woman come up to me and said, I'm one of the 144,000. I said, you're an interesting man who's never known a woman. <laughs> you can't make things what they are not. You are, dear lady, first, you are not a man. Second, you are not one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Consecrated unto the Lord. And third, you are a woman. <laughs> so it's impossible for you have never... So we just left it there because I didn't want to get hung up. <laughs> so they're preaching. And they're being slain. They're being killed all the way through this thing. And Israel's going to be turned unto the Lord. 
And, and somebody says, well, could it be a possibility that there's Christians that are left behind that suddenly get to run in with the program? Sure, I'm fine with that. I can see that. I could see that possibly that even the majority of the church was left behind. I mean, yeah, I knew, you know, I could see the possibility of that. And um, so to speculate that this is clear evidence that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is in the tribulation, well, that's just speculation. And it overrides so much evidence that the church has been, the church of the Lord Jesus has taken out and they're at the marriage supper of the Lamb right at this time. So, um, then verse 10. Well, of course, they, they cried out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you not judge and avenge our blood of them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little while until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So it's specifically during the tribulation. Here's the law of the tribulation. To get into the first resurrection, to be part of the first co company of the resurrection, you have to be killed. You have to be martyred. You have to be killed during the tribulation. That is the rule set right there. Wait until your fellow servants who shall also be killed just as you are, are gathered up. How wide are they killed for? The word of their testimony. Are you with me? Do you see that? I want you to just spend a little time meditating on it. Any questions you have about that? Any, any extra additional information between now and the next time we meet that you would I, like uh, to ask me concerning how do I know that this isn't the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm happy to supply that information. Verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. There are going to be a series of six earthquakes in... Uh, the tribulation the last the sixth the fifth and the sixth earthquake takes place towards the end of the 16th chapter in I believe it's the um, sixth vial and by the time that happens there are no more mountains left on the earth I drive by Shasta I see it blowing I can see it blow I brought, drive by Mana I see it blown all these, all these volcanoes, all these active, you know, we live in a very geodesic, therm, a geothermic area uh, in, um, in, here in California. Every earthquake, every fault line, every uh, inactive, inactive volcano, everything begins to blow. It all begins to blow. Just imagine every... A Every Mount St. Helen that exists just in the western United States going off. And believe me, they're all across the United States. You know, just imagine when the, when the plates start moving. You know, science believe from the geological plate studies, uh, they calculate the, the age of, of various different things on the earth. And, of course, we know the, I know that the earth is far older than 6,000 years I know that the Bible clearly just states for us that the earth is ancient. And, but what happened was all of the landmass was together. God describes in Genesis all the landmass being together. And during the days of Peleg, he separated the earth. So the, all of the landmass divided. It didn't take, you know, hundreds of millions of years. It just moved into place where he set them into place. And, of course, that was cataclysmic. Well, we're going to have similar things going to happen again. The time you get to the millennial reign, the earth is going to be gathered back to one in one landmass again, and there will be only one great sea. One. Pretty radical. We know we haven't gone through the tribulation. There are some people who believe we're in the millennium right now. Cute millennium. Are you with me? No, there's whole groups of people who believe we're in the millennial reign right now. Look, dear people, it doesn't even come close to lining up with the verses of Scripture in the Bible. Okay? Now, we don't give you this information to argue with it. It's not a... You know, you know what? And maybe I shouldn't be so cynical and poking fun at everybody, but they're just wrong, you know? And I, maybe I shouldn't be, you know... Um, 
quite as, quite as ferocious as I am, but I feel a greater ferocity coming up inside of me. But <clears throat> I'm that way. This is the way I feel about it. So, verse 12, And I beheld, and he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black, as sackcloth, and the moon became as blood. This is going to happen again. It happens at the beginning of the tribulation, and then it happens again at the end of the tribulation. And Jesus talks about both. We're going we're to get into some of the scriptures tonight. Now look at this. And the stars fell from heaven. Now there are some skeptics that say, so look at that, this is crazy. I mean, the stars fall from heaven. They're not these little teeny tiny dots up there in the sky. <laughs> They're bigger than the earth. Well, we can also understand from the original language that we're dealing with meteors here. Okay? So, imagine, can we collect all of this happening all at one time together here? Because if we begin to break this down sequentially, clearly this has happened in, in, and could easily be defined as happening within the framework of a year and a half. Or less time. All of this stuff is going on almost, if it's not happening all at once, well, it's not happening all at once. If it's not happening in waves all at once, like day one, day two, day three, day four, it's happening like month one, month four, month eight, huh? month 12, month 16. Pretty radical, huh? Yeah. What's left standing? Look at this verse of scripture. I'm going to show you some other verse, corollary verse of scripture in Isaiah and Jeremiah with us in just a minute. The stars of heaven, look at this. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. We are talking about a violent deluge of meteors. Huh? Somebody said, oh, well, that's how the moon's turned into blood. That's how the moon and sun's turned into sackcloth. Not necessarily. Because these are all signs and wonders and miracles. And if you look at them sequentially, sun's, you know, the sun, it is a sackcloth sun. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine how cold that is? You might imagine how cold that is. That's cold. That would be what you would describe as a nuclear storm. Or, or a big meteor creates a huge dust cloud and so creates an eclipse of the sun that you can't see the sun. It's like sack, sackcloth over it. You're, the temperature is going to just drop to, you know, 30 below, 70 below. It's going to be like the Arctic. Then, that was just your warning. It's getting ready to happen. Look at, it, look at the moon. Look at the sun. It's about ready to hit. Somebody said, why? God's wrath against sin is how he feels about sin. He's held back. He's held back. Job said, he stored all of these things up until the day of wrath. He calls the hailstone and the snow and the stormy wind the weapons that he's going to use to fight against iniquity. People don't realize this in the modern humanistic age. God hates sin. He hates it with a passion. He loves us. He hates iniquity. He's doing everything to separate us from it. He did so in Christ Jesus. He's doing everything to call us out. Don't have nothing to do with it. Destroy you. It's dead. Huh? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made us free from loss and death. We got to grid a hole. For me, the book of Revelation is such a profound description of God's indignation and, uh, and judgment against sin and iniquity in my life that was poured out and revealed when Jesus was crucified. Somebody said, why did Jesus have to be crucified like that? Why did he have to be so thrashed and so beaten, so mutilated? Because that's what sin is worthy of. And he, bear, he became sin from, he became the sin offering for my sake. Mm -hmm. 
I want you to see that. I want you to feel that in the book of Revelation. I don't want you to look at it from some kind of analytical analysis. I want you to feel the spiritual reality. It is, this isn't some mystical, esoteric, uh, I, uh, uh, spiritualized um, wording uh, that, that has no real meaning and value and relevance to us right now. This is concrete, real stuff of how God is going to deal with his anger and deal with his judgment against men who will not turn from sin, who determine to go on in it. And I'm telling you, there is not a lot of difference between Israel saying, we're in have we sinned against you. Look at here, we're, your take. we're at the church, we're at the building, we're offering the sacrifice, we're giving in the offering. What are you talking about? It's one thing to say it to the preacher. He said, no, 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 you never stopped running your own way and doing your own thing and allowing this stuff that I told you not to have in your life. You never turn from it, he says it by the prophets from the beginning. He did now, and so he can say it by his prophets today. Amen. Amen. And so, and the heavens departed as a scroll. When it's rolled together. It's like, it's like, you could imagine it like this. The roll, you know, you know how, you know how, can you hold this for me just a minute? Have you ever had an ancient roll, scroll and you, and you unroll it and it's been rolled up together for a while, right? You stretch it out, let go of it, pop! The great bang just reversed. The big bang just went in reverse. Huh? Snaps back together. That's one way to look at it. I view it from a different perspective and it's fine to view it from that way because that's the most literal way to view it. And I believe the most literal way to view it is, is, is the best way to, to view it. But I also see that there is a dimension that takes place. Something takes place. It's different in the earth after this happens. Mm. Men are now able to look at sky level, cloud level, and see God's on the throne. And Jesus said his right hand. All of a sudden, the parallel universes, the dimensions that separate. I'm going to use modern terminology now. Forgive me. I'm going to use things that you can describe mathematically going on. The things, the spiritual dimension versus the earthly. That the invisible dimension from where we try to understand and quantitate electrons and, and, and flavors and quartz and beauties and all the other subatomic energy that we understand defines all the material world of matter, that invisible world is much different than that. It's a spiritual realm, and we then all of a sudden, we see it for what it is, and we see the heavenly host, and we see all the various different dimensions and elements of things that we can't even begin to describe that exist right now, and we try to quantitate them and analyze them and utilize them to, to determine what's actually happening in, in the events that are happening in our physical world, and we call it physics, and now it developed into quantum physics and all that other stuff, which is not necessary to talk about. I'm just saying there's a, there is another world, a spiritual world that is right here that we can actually have sensors at this very moment to be able to measure its reality and its existence. And science wants to sit there and spin the little propeller and try to talk about, you know, some subatomic world that came into existence purely by random events and accidents. And it's impossible. And so if you want to get something, go to the anthropic theory because the anthropic theory is going to take a while for it to ever trickle down to the college level, high school level, much less elementary school. And it shows where Yale... And, and Princeton and other um, uh, scientists uh, got together and created a statistical model to take all the various different known uh, inputs that we are quantifiable that make up our physical and natural world into a model and with the variance because if the earth was too much, you know, any you know, plus or minus distance from the sun, it would either be too hot or too cold. And we go on with all these various different variables all the way down to um, photosynthesis. And they put all those variables in a model and they asked the question to the statistical model, did this happen by accident? No one in a hundred billion chance I did, or a hundred million chance I did. And ultimately, without going all through the statistics, the analysis came out that the earth was designed specifically for man. 
the probability was something like one in 10 million. So right after that's when all of a sudden you heard the storm of parallel universes. Because now if it's one in 10, 10 million, then we've got to have 10 million parallel universes so that we could have one event happen in 10 million. Because we're going to deny God, we're going to get out of this one way or the other. Even though our science has achieved the level of being able to ask these models, these questions, and get a very clear answer, no, it was created by design specifically for men. Pretty radical. Go look and study the anthropic theory because there was a whole series of questions asked in the model. The model's still active to this day. Anthropic theory. Okay, back to here. It's hard to keep me on track. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks and the mountains. I want you to understand what God is saying here is there's no escape. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, how influential you are, how powerful you are, how nothing you are. It doesn't matter. There is no exemption. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Got it? Yeah. And we can understand when there's that many, when there's that many meteors hitting the earth. Does that make sense to you? This is the sixth seal. We're not in the third trumpet. It's going to be pretty bad when the third trumpet gets here. We're not going to talk about the third trumpet tonight. They said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. Fall on us. And hide us. We're ready to die and go to hell right now. Somebody said there is no death. There's death. Somebody say, man cannot die during the tribulation. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. We just saw in the fifth seal, <laughs> men died. So I, I always wonder, I'm going, where did they get this stuff? And then I, I calm myself. And I say, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Uh, 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 love edifies, knowledge buffs up. But you could die. They would rather die and go right down in the hill. They would not repent. They rather let the rocks fall upon them and hide them from the face of him that sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Is that an interesting one? See that? Wrath of the Lamb. Wrath of Jesus. Today in a modern humanistic society, we have no doctrinal concept of an angry Lamb of God. Of a, of a Jesus Christ the Lamb of God who's pouring out his wrath and indignation upon sin and iniquity for which he died to deliver man from and ultimately come and stomping and smashing it till their blood squirts up upon his garments. And so, so, so much so that they say, who is this who comes from Bozra with his garments dipped in blood? Yeah. That's another thing I'm going to tell you about. Bozra is a rock, rock, hubble, uh, a rock heap right now. Bozra and Timon Obadiah says, will become centerpieces of the earth. It's southern, it's southern Jordan. It's Saudi Arabia, kind of. You know, it's just Saudi Arabia. It's just desert. Southern Jordan. There's nothing there. It's rock heap. I mean, a rock, a rock heap. Just a bunch of rubble. Okay? What's going to happen? I personally believe that because it is ancient Edom, that the Edomedians, the ancient Edomites, will be moved there. They are called the Palestinians. And that the world will get together and will create a homeland for them. And I believe that there is going to be a number of geog uh, geog uh, geographical changes, climate changes. These are things that I believe. They have to be confirmed. They're just what I believe. I'm just letting it out. What I believe. I know what I do know. What's fact? Bozer and Teman will become, once again, nations that will have a significant impact and influence in the world so that all the nations will wonder at it. Read Obadiah. I'll bring that out later because that's what I'm doing in these, in these series of meetings. I want to bring out things that people aren't looking at and understanding developments that have to take place yet. And, and help you to be able to understand and see uh, um, a little bit more detail in terms of the signs of the time, okay? So, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? 
Now, I just want to, I want to take you, after having read that, I just kind of want to take you through some of the, some of the prophets. Just, I know it's already getting late. It runs late on me quickly, all the time. <laughs> I'm always battling against time. And I'm going to just give you a couple of verses of Scripture that you see elsewhere in the, in the Bible that talks about these same events specifically, okay? And um, let's just start with what Jesus had to say about them. But he says, and, I, and, and, and I'm, going to start, I'm going to start because I, I, I referred to something that will happen after the tribulation, okay? At the end. That being the sun and the moon being darkened. It happens at the beginning and it happens at the end. And I want to, because I didn't jump to it in the book of Revelation and show you where it happens at the end, I just wanted you to hear Jesus say it. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24, he says, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Okay? A little bit different, isn't it? Right? Not turn to blood, but will not give light. Okay? And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Satan will be cast down to the earth during the middle of the tribulation. He will be cast out of the unseen realm into the seen realm. He will literally be cast down to earth. There is an ancient monument, the ancient monument that all the world worshiped, is called Mount Nimrod, which is, we would call it now Mount Nimroy or now Mount Nimrod. Nimrod from Nineveh in Assyria led an, a rebellion against God that was, is very similar to what the Antichrist will do. And we see different types of that come down since Nimrod. We see Nebuchadnezzar do many things that the Antichrist will be allowed to do during the tribulation. He made an image, remember? Yeah. And he commanded all the world to bow down and worship the image. He just said that it's just what's going to happen is the Antichrist is going to take it to another level, and it's called the Eighth Kingdom. And in the Eighth Kingdom, he will give power to that image to speak. And so I'm going to give you a bunch of information real quick. Don't worry about it. Just hang with me, okay? The eighth kingdom, there's been a total up to this point of six kingdoms. The first kingdom, these are the kingdoms that oppressed Israel. The first kingdom being Egypt, the second kingdom being Assyria, the third kingdom being Babylon, the fourth kingdom being Media Persia, the fifth kingdom being Greece, Alexander the Great. Every one of them have key functions in the book of Daniel. Daniel so accurately prophesied Alexander the Great that men will not believe that out that 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 uh, the book of Daniel was written before Alexander the Great because he is so accurate in his prophecy, but now there's that much more proof from the blade of the archaeologist that it was indeed written before Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great had one of the, one of the angels from out of the bottomless pit come and help him and give him power to conquer the world in seven years. Yeah, he was the leper. And so we're going to talk more about that later. You know, because I want you to be able to see how governmental powers are being set up and positioned, how things are being positioned governmentally, economically, and socially that fit right within those patterns that we can very clearly go back into history and we can very clearly look at prophetic uh, scriptures like Daniel and see what happened and see what developed and understand that certain elements of that is going to be repeated again and we can see the developmental process of what's taking place. Then the sixth empire was the kingdom that was during the days of John. And he talked about the kingdom that was, that a beast that was and is and shall rise up out of the bottomless pit. The beast that was, he ruled over Alexander the Great, the beast that is, Roman Empire, okay, during the time that he was alive, and the, and, and the beast that will rise up out of the bottomless pit, pit is the seventh kingdom. The seventh kingdom will have dominance for the first three and a half years. We can talk about what that looks like. Some people had various different theories that they've, that they've espoused over the years that have already capitulated because those, those structures aren't even existing in the same way anymore, okay? And uh, so we already knew from the scripture that the seventh kingdom was very different than the way it was being described. And then there is the eighth kingdom. The eighth kingdom is the beast kingdom. 
That's going to be our unique kingdom. I'm going to throw something out at you. Get ready, people. Get ready. Just brace yourself. I've known this for many years. The Lord's never allowed me to say it. I've got to release tonight. <laughs> the scripture says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days. Of the, of the, in the last days. These days that we're talking about. They were eating and drinking and giving in marriage. There was a bunch of partying going on. A unique kind of partying. They were partying with angels. They were partying with fallen angels. There's nothing wrong with being married and giving in marriage. Except for this will be a time, a very short time that it's, been, that it's allowed. Not a length of time. Huh? And so we see the rise of the occult where people are more accepting interaction with the occult and with angels. And there's this great hunger and there's great fascination with all of these demon spirits and with all of this witchcraft and with the Harry Potter. It's all one big design to ultimately achieve this acceptance once again that as it was in the days of Noah. Go read about what was going on in the days of Noah. It's very unique from all other times. The sons, the fallen angels, the fallen sons of God came in and cohabitated with the daughters of men. Those particular angels, Peter said, are now bound in, in change in hell right now because they left their first estate and fornicated with strange flesh. Well, I can also show you another way. Because when you see the image in Daniel chapter 2, you can see that the feet were made of clay and of iron because angels can't mix with men. And that was the weakness of the seventh kingdom. Huh? Because that's the seventh kingdom. The feet of clay and of iron. Because Daniel didn't show the eighth kingdom in the last three and a half years. The eighth kingdom. Satan is here. Manifest. Revealed. Seen. Walking around. Manifest. 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 Comes down the earth. Middle of the th seven and a half year. I mean, uh, th seven year. Three and a half years in. Cast into the earth. The beast kingdom now. We see it on another scale. Remember the three Hebrew children got thrown in the fire for not bowing? Huh? You're going to be killed for not, not just not bowing, but not taking his mark. The mark does not even start until in the middle of the tribulation. There's only three and a half years left. Somebody says, well, there's this chip. It's the mark of the beast. No. That's way up in the trumpets, boys. Stop. We, how can we have be having... What is the mark of the beast? Oh, it's 666. Well, what's that? And how many verses of Scripture must you have in the Bible to establish any doctrine? At least two. And we'd rather have three. And how many verses of Scripture says anything about 666? One. And that can be interpreted in many different ways from the original language. And yet people are running around saying 666, and everybody's over here looking for 666. Meanwhile, over there doing, meanwhile Satan's over there doing his thing. Do you get it? So we really want to stick with the Word. We want to have wide, eyes wide open. We want to understand where we're at and where we're going. That's the best possibility of defining a perfect route to get there. And don't take any shortcuts. Because that's the longest distance between two points. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Everybody knows that? Yep. We're going to take a shortcut. <laughs> Meanwhile, we could have been there 10 hours ago. <laughs> Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Once again. The Lord's talking about the end of the tribulation. What's going to go ahead and what's going to take place. Mm -hmm. Just imagine, all we did, all I wanted to do tonight was give you a taste for the first few days, for the first few months. What's going to happen? You, no one's going to be guessing, wondering, has it started yet? <laughs> we got that? Yeah. If you can walk away with that tonight, you have a security. You have an, a, a compass, an ability to na navigate more right. effectively through all the stuff, the melu of stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. These guys who prophesied about the big red moons and all the other nonsense <laughs> and actually missed, mixed, mixed up their dates. They didn't even get their dates right. They didn't even get their history right on it. 
net everybody in a panic back in April? Come on. Why is it that their ministries are still allowed to go on after that big snafu? Oops. We got to go back and recalculate. Okay, well, my, my admonition is don't listen to all of this stuff. Just go to the Word. I'm not saying to disrespect authority. I'm not. I am saying that every person has a right to step up and say, hey, wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute, pastor. Help us see where the Word of God establishes that. And where do we have two or three witnesses on this prophecy seeing as you've raised this scale? And how about all these credible men of God that are standing around us saying, no, 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 no. That, wait a minute, stop, time out. We need to be in submission to one another, okay? There needs to be a clear, this is, con look, it's, there's safety in numbers over here. We need to get in tight ranks, okay? Love one another, commit ourselves to God, and have willing, willingness to hear reproof and instruction. So quickly, I'm going to try to do this quickly. You know me, it's hard for me to do anything quickly. <laughs> Joel 2, 31. The sun shall be darkened, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood. Well, when is that one going to happen? Tell me, when is that going to happen? This is a test. Joel puts this right in with the age, right on the end of the age of the church. It, it, we thought it was somewhere else until Peter got up and prophesied the Holy Ghost is going to be poured out. And then ultimately he comes right in after that event. And he says in Joel 2.31, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? The great and terrible day of the Lord. You know what the great and terrible day of the Lord is? It's his great wrath. Mm -hmm. It starts in the middle of the tribulation. That's called the great tribulation. That's when things get... It's just, getting, it's just getting warmed up. It's like the pitcher in the bullpen warming up, okay? The Lord just now saying, okay, I'm, I'm going ahead and I'm releasing some of my wrath right now. I'm, I'm releasing some of my wrath upon that iniquity. It's been stored up. It's just coming down. And he's just warming up. By the, three, by the middle of the seven year, he's, put, he's pouring it on. Mm. So we saw that the moon was turned into blood in the sixth seal. Right. Correct? Correct. That's what Joel chapter 2, verse 31 is referring to. The one, there's going to be another event that, I, that is misunderstood by people where the moon doesn't give any more light. The cosmos has changed now. The orbits have changed now. The heavens have been shaken now. We're not... Isaiah, I'll just give it to you in a minute. The earth shall rock to and forth, to and fro like a drunken man. Imagine what's going on. The earth is stable because it's held upon its axis. A big part of that is what? The moon and the effect of the sun and the orbits of the planets coming down. Now it's going to rock to and fro like a drunken man. Tell me what's going on now. Tell me what's going on now. People, this is not Holy Ghost hallelujah time. We're having revival on the earth. It's hard to have church. <laughs> the earth is... Okay. Amen. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. Mm -mm 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 -mm. That equals extremely cold. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. This is the end of the tribulation. It is frozen on the earth, dear folks. It is extremely cold with all the rest of the stuff that's going down. There, there is, there is, it, is, it is absolutely God's outpouring of how he feels about the sin that you and I would somehow be willing to condone instead of rising up and fighting against it and saying no. One day I was in a situation where uh, we went into a hotel room and in this hotel room where I'm in Canada and they had this little, they had this little thing on the, on the, on the um, 
on the television advertising pornography and I heard almost audibly, my hand shall find all of my enemies, my right hand shall seek them out. I mean, I heard Father in his indignation because Satan has set up a ploy. What, 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 what would you hear that pornography is primarily targeting kids eight years old? That is beyond even rationalizing that they set up key words so that something that, that eight-year-old kids would, be, would lo be looking for on the Internet. People, it is a ploy of Satan to destroy the souls of men, and we have got to take this thing to another level because they are being imprisoned against the Word of God by social dictates. Satan has got the upper hand. Somebody said light so much greater than darkness, and it is. But I'm telling you, the darkness seems to be outdoing the light. And it really comes down to not God's fault because he has commissioned you and me and we're going to have to kick it in here now. Amen. We're going to have to kick it in now. And that means I can stop talking about my problems, thinking about my problems, living my problems, doing my thing, get on my face, fast and pray, touch heaven, to heaven changes me. Amen. Because people are dying and going to a devil's hell. They are being snared up. I said to the Lord, I said, Father, how? What do we got to do to stop this? I mean, one day I was like crying out, I'll bring down those satellites right now in Jesus' name. And you know, a couple came down, I think. The big ones didn't. I believe they did. In fact, I believe Chrissy gave me a report. Not about within a couple of weeks, a couple of satellites hit the earth. I believe that was a coincidence. So I'm getting, I'm getting warmed up here. Call a couple more of those things down. In Jesus' name. You foul spirit of hell. I mean, I feel it in every part of my body. There's nothing make, there's nothing fictional or make believe in that. There's no performance, nothing in that, man. I feel I'm at war. People say, why are you, why do you look so angry? I'm in the middle of a conflict over souls, man. The devil, our enemy, is up against us, and I'm I've set myself here like Flint. To do what God said to do. And you have to live that and breathe that and think it and eat it because he's a slithering serpent. He's, he, he just, just waits for the moment of your weakness and your vulnerability to come pounced on you. We're going to be wiser. Mm -hmm. ah. We're going to be stronger. Mm -hmm. We're going to be more anointed. We're going to be more, more aggressive. We're going to be more vigilant. We're going to be more passionate. We're going to be more purposed in these things in God. In Jesus' name. And listen to what he says in verse 11. And I will punish the world for their evil. And the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogance of the proud. What's the next? I, I don't have the rest of it down here. To cease. Praise God. What a, it's heaven on earth when there's no more, when the arrogant and the proud cease. I check myself. I keep myself under. I keep myself into his rule. I say, oh God, shine your floodlight upon heaven and on me. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, teach me to give myself fully and wholly over to that humility. And oh boy, you know, it really gets challenged when all of a sudden somebody's saying something about us that we don't like or doing something that we don't like, whether or not we're going to give ourselves over to the spirit of meekness and humility. People always defending themselves, and within that defense is pride and arrogancy. And I know how Papa feels about it. I know how he feels about it. See, for me, this is the value of prophecy. This is the meaning to, for it. This is why I, I teach on it. I don't want to isolate it just to say, you know, this, to talk about, you know, spectacular events in the future where everybody's scared of the future. I want you to be scared of the now. In, in rabbinic tradition, in ancient Hebrew tradition, there was a concept that's called the fear of sin. You know why the concept was developed? Because you could end up under a pile of rocks. There were certain sins that God said, don't only stone them, hang them after you stone them and then burn them. That's, that's killing them three times. That's what I do to snakes that I don't like. Huh? <laughs> I smash them, I cut their head off, huh? You with me? And then I bury it, right? 
Is that right? Yeah. We do it, man. We separate their, their head so far from their tail <laughs> that they can never find each other. Not in all of eternity. Huh? Sometimes just go ahead and pull those things out, too. But anyway, okay. <laughs> Stars of heaven shaken. Isaiah 34. And the host of heaven shall be dissolved. <sighs> now, I, I, I didn't get in. There's one thing I want to say here. I'm not getting into the end of the tribulation when the heavens and the earth shall be destroyed by fire, which Peter talks about in 2 Peter, which is referred to also in Revelation 22 and in Isaiah 66. I'm still just talking about tribulation, then there's the millennial time, and then at the end of the millennial, God's going to destroy the, the, the heaven and earth and he's going to make a new heaven and new earth. He's going to destroy it by fire. He's going to make a new heaven and new earth. Wherein dwells only righteousness. And there will never be another chance for sin and iniquity to happen. It will be purged. Everybody, the last purging, will be at the end of the tribulation. I mean, forgive me, at the end of the millennial reign. Because another almost, almost, a, a very similar event is going to happen again at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. We'll be there dealing with people. People be living a thousand years in human bodies. Kind of, they could they could come through the tribulation. About there's a percentage of men that will come through the tribulation. It says one third of Egypt, one third of Syria. You know. As far as the total population, we don't know, but there's a percentage of men will come through the tribulation, go into the millennial reign, and for a thousand years will live and procreate and have families, and we will be teaching them. And we'll be showing the ways of God. Of course, the Lord will deal with sin immediately. There won't be grace as we have it, postponed judgment. It'll be immediate judgment. The Lord will actually take human populations up to Babylon where they can look straight down into hell and see in the hell people screaming and hollering in the lake of fire. Pretty radical, eh? It's going to be real serious. Real serious. I'm going to talk more about those as we go along because it's such an important part of prophecy. This separating out the world that now is and the world that is to come. There was a world before. There is a world now. This is the same world of Noah. So they were ignorantly ignorant of that the world that then was. When Peter says that, he's talking about another world, another cosmos. He's not talking about Noah's flood. He's talking about another flood. Okay. We have the same world, same cosmos right now, same, same constellations, same order in heaven, same vegetation, same earth, same sphere of living. But understanding this current, present age right now, that's what we call the church age, the bridge between the church age and, the, and Christ's millennial reign, which is the tribulation, where God throws out his wrath on sin and iniquity, casts Satan and his demon spirits and his angels that fell with them out of the heavenly realm into the earthly realm. Take them, bind them, throw them into the pit. Praise God. And then rules over men with his resurrected saints for 1,000 years. And then after men live in that, of course he's, there's a judgment as I said because he's ruling with a rod of iron. There will still be a great falling away, believe it or not. There will be so many people who say we are so sick of living under his rulership be so tired of having to do it his way, they will fall out to Satan. Because Gog and Magog will rise up again. Gog and Magog is not a nation. Gog and Magog is something that's behind a nation. They are spiritual powers of darkness. They are angels of darkness. I don't care. You might want to try to trace Gog and Magog from a a pedigree from a lineage and try to trace them back to a Slavic group of people and I can understand how that is done. But clearly, it is a spiritual entity behind Gog and Magog because God, when, Gog, when, when the, the geography of the earth is changed, Gog and Magog comes up and encamps against the saints once again and we know that at that point in time, it is perfectly associated with Satan because it is that moment in time that Satan is loosed from the pit and now goes and gathers together out of the earth all of those that will follow him and comes up to try to destroy God for one last final time. People say Satan's defeated. Well, he don't believe it. He don't believe one word of it. Not now and, gonna, and not until the end of the tribulation. 
I mean, the end of the millennial reign of Christ. And that will be his final stand. Because I truly believe he thinks that if he can get enough men following him, he can, make, he can demand that God capitulate and release his hold upon mankind. And I believe that that's part of the dialogue going on between Job and God. God and, and Satan's going, everybody's following me and everybody's ser serving me. And the Lord said, I got one. I got one man. His name's Job. Look at him. He's perfect and he's righteous. Huh? So people who believe there's none righteous, no, not one, you have to deal with Job. Because God said he was, and God's not a liar. Amen. So I'll, I'll just finish that right there. I'm going to leave that for later. Okay, that's another, that's another topic. Amen. I'm just trying to just dress everything all at once. That's my style. That's the way we roll. <laughs> There's not enough time. I just try to deal with all the subjects for one time. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is er utterly broken down, the earth is clean, broken. I'm in, um, forgive me, I'm in Isaiah, Isaiah 24, and I told you to turn to Isaiah 34, didn't I? Yeah. 34 to start off with. And the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. Remember reading that? Yeah. Everybody there? Yeah. yeah. Right there, right? Six seal, right? Revelation chapter 6. Somebody said he copied it from Isaiah. No, he didn't. He got it right from the Lord. He was writing it out as the Lord said it. Probably the word of God hasn't changed. And the host... And all their hosts shall fall down, and the, and and the, as, as the leaf falls off from the vine, and as uh, the falling of the fig from the fig tree, almost word for word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Of what Jesus said, and what J Jesus reported to John in the book of Revelation. It's coming. It's coming. It's not. It's not if. It's when. Huh? It's going to happen. It's coming. Are you prepared? Isaiah 24. There's only one way, to be, one, one, one way to be prepared. Huh? There's only one way to be prepared. One way to be prepared. To have ears developed to hear the things of the Spirit. So when he descends with the voice of an archangel. Hallelujah. The sound of a trumpet. <laughs> and the dead in Christ rise and we which are alive and remain caught up to meet him in the air. So shall we forever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's the, only, that's the way to be prepared. To be watching diligently because you know not what hour your master shall return. This is what he said the kingdom of God is like. It's what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like unto one who was a householder, the ruler over his house, and he took all of his goods and he left it unto his servants and he told them to occupy and he told them to watch until you return. He gave us his goods, signs, wonders, miracles, authority, power, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, these wonderful things to represent heaven, to do the work of the, and the, of the ministry. And he told us to watch, to be careful, to be sober, to be vigilant. Because we know not at the hour that our Lord shall return. And then he gives us warnings about how we could be behaving ourselves and acting. And then what the results would be if we weren't watching and being sober. I'm going to watch. Amen. I'm not going to hell. No. And I'm not going, I'm going to do everything I possibly can do to keep everybody out of hell. Hell is real to me. I haven't been graced to be able to see it like so many other men have. But it is so real to me. It's real to me. Having not seen it, it is so real to me. It's something as though I had been there and I know it and I could tell you and describe it. That's how real it is to me. And I pray it becomes that real to you because you'll live a different kind of life. In Jesus' name, tonight, let it be that way. In Jesus' name, tonight. For the windows of chapter, Isaiah 24, verse 18, the windows of on high are open and the foundation of the earth do sake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunken, uh, like a drunkard, and shall be removed uh, like a cottage. And the transgressors thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And literally, Isaiah is saying that the earth cannot stand any longer because it can't bear the weight of sin and iniquity. It's as though all creation says it is sin and iniquity is so foul. It has diseased us and made us sick so long. It begins to blah, vomit it out that it might be released from its burden. That's the way that, it's really that's exactly the way that Paul described it in Romans chapter 8 as well. It's too heavy. It's laden heavy. It's laden so heavy. There's so much weight upon it. It can't stand in its orbit anymore. It spins out of control from the weight of sin and iniquity. Mm. Mm. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on, that are on high. Once again, speaking to spiritual wickedness in high places, they're going to be cast out of the realm of heaven, the realm of the unseen, to the earth. I just want to real quickly talk to you quickly just about civil war. And as, as we talked about there in the um, second seal when peace is taken from the earth. Haggai chapter 2. And I will shake the heavens and I will shake the earth. Verse 22, Haggai 22. And I will overthrow thrones of, of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. I will overthrow the chariot. I will overthrow them that ride upon them. I will overthrow the horse. I will overthrow the rider. And riders shall come down every one by the sword of his brother everyone this is how I'm going to destroy them this is my wrath this is how it's going to be poured out Haggai 2.22 I will destroy them everyone by the sword of his brother that's worse than the civil war that's the neighbor rising up against the neighbor to destroy each other they just kill each other in the backyard as it were second seal takes peace from the earth every man's sword set against his neighbor Ezekiel 38, 18. And it shall come to pass in the same time when God shall come up against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy, in the fire of my wrath, have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. This is talking about the middle of the tribulation now. I can prove that to you, but I don't have time. I've run way out of time. I'll prove it to you later. You can email me. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beast of the field and the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains saith the Lord God every man's sword shall be against his brother once again Peace taken from the earth, second seal. And um, here we have, here's, here we have um, the possibility, I could say that there's some prophecy that is not sequential here, that it's past, present, and future stuff that's going on. But it's a possibility that that kind of civil war happens a, a second time in the book of tribulation, I mean, in the revelation, during the book of tribulation, in the book of Revelation, during the tribulation, it's just not mentioned. Isaiah 19, 2. And I will set the Egyptian against the Egyptian, and they shall fight everyone against his brother, and everyone against his neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. Every level. Civil war at every level. Civil war. Internal. Self-destruct. Okay? Self-destruct at every level. This is before the Armageddon. It's before the Battle of Armageddon. I, I want you to look at this. The Lord drying up the seas. Drying up the rivers. Jeremiah 51, 36. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will plead thy cause and take vengeance for thee. And I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Here he's specifically speaking against the areas of modern day Iran and Iraq. Ultimately, that will, is the ancient city of Babylon. The ancient kingdom of Assyria plays an important role in end time prophecy. Usually in the prophets, when they're talking about the Antichrist, they're talking about the Assyrian. All the whole forming of that nation, the whole forming of that rebellion is seen in the rebellion of Nimrod. All of his idols are, are a rubble heap right now, but they will be raised up again. They'd be raised up again. It'll become a center of worship again. Go Google tonight. Go Google. When you go home, go Google Mount Nimrod. Okay? It's easy to remember, remember it that way because you can find it like that. That was the center of ancient worship. It's going to happen again. Nahum. Chapter 1, he rebuketh the sea and maketh, to, makes it, maketh it dry and dryeth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him 
the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. What we see a number of times, it's not just for the end time, we see two different times in the history where God dr dried up rivers and he dried up, dried up the Nile. And, um, but this time it's on the level of the seas. This time it's on, it's on an entirely different level. You talk about drought. You talk about death by drought. You talk about death by famine. You talk about the spread of disease because of mass, huge masses of human beings dying. Mm. Wrath of God is being poured out. It's not the time for a glorious church. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Not, it's not nothing about a glorious church here. Right. Uh, he's coming for a church, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. In the height of its splendor. There's no such thing happening in the book of tribulation. <laughs> the book of Revelation during tribulation. There's nothing happening like that. Right. It's the wrath of God being poured out. Literally, death and destruction. And then I, I just, I want to read this one verse of scripture and jump to Revelation chapter 16 just in closing. Just kind of let you look into the future for just a minute. Because this is one of the last big events in, in, the, in, in the vile judgments. And the vials are being poured out. The vials of his wrath. Vials of his wrath. Store it up. God's no respecter of persons. He's not going to judge one for one thing and not hold everybody accountable to the same thing. No matter what dispossession he shows us, whether it's day, he's not holding Lot, he's not holding Sodom and Gomorrah responsible for something different than he held Capernaum. He said to Capernaum, "If Sodom, if what I preached to you was preached in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented." What was he telling? Them? He says wickedness has such an increased effect; it's a, it, uh, an increased compound effect on the state of man that now you, Capernaum, are worse off than Sodom and Gomorrah. You have less ability to hear the, the Spirit of the Lord speak than Sodom and Gomorrah. Where are we at now? I, all I can do is cry out to God and say, Lord, cause me to see, cause me to hear, and cause me to be able to deliver those things which you are saying from your own heart, from your own lips. And you do the same thing with me. And I'm telling you right now, we'll just step over and we'll move out of all of this, you know, pursuing our own interests and all of our own ideas and wants and wishes and start living for the kingdom because we rec recognize this thing's getting wrapped up. This thing's getting wrapped up. It's getting wrapped up quick. We're going to go into more of that and my proofs to why this thing is being wrapped up quick. But that'll be for later because you can't do it all in one night, right? Or can we? No. <laughs> Revelation 6, verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake. This is the last one. This is the big one. Such as was not since men were upon the earth. Are you with me? This is the sixth and final earthquake of the book of Revelation. And it has not been since men were upon the earth. For it was so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the, and, and, and the cities of the nations fell... And Babylon came into remembrance before God to give to her the cup of the wine of his fierceness of his wrath. And every island of the sea ceased to exist. Ceased to exist. Disappeared. Ceased to exist. And the mountains were no more. Somebody said that's spiritual. It can be spiritual, but it first has to be literal. There's a literal meaning and there is a spiritual meaning. There's no question about it. It first has to be literal. So I pray in the name of Jesus, every one of you tonight, you'll understand the soberness, the godly fear, the sobriety that Peter was talking about. He said, knowing these things with what great sobriety and godliness and holy fear should we live our lives? We must get this. We must understand Father's heart about things. He loves us so much. Mm -hmm. He's made a way for us to get it. He's made a way for us to make it. He's made a way for us to have every good thing 
praise God, we can all walk out of this place tonight being certain of this one thing, that he that began the good work in us will finish it. Yes. And man, I'm telling you, I'll lay hold on that. I don't take that for granted. Don't take your wife for granted. Don't take your husband for granted. Don't take any relationship for granted. Make it very valuable, especially the one that you have with the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Everybody be blessed in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that there's no one that walks out of here tonight, Jesus' name, with anything less than a glad heart with a thankful heart. But Father, we thank you for the sobriety. We thank you, God, for the soberness. We thank you, God, for the vigilance. We thank you, Father God, for the holy indignation in our lives. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, I speak peace. Jesus' name, I speak peace. I speak peace in Jesus' name. Peace in Jesus' name. Peace in Jesus' name. Peace in Jesus' name. Upon everyone who hears in this place, everyone who's watching us on the web, my YouTube. Amen. Amen. Don't pass by anybody unless you hug them, remember. <laughs>